Hello everyone. I hope you're doing well. I hope you've had a wonderful holiday. Thank you so much for joining me. If you, uh, Oh, sorry, I just sat down and grabbed my headset right at the five second mark. So, still, uh, still getting my head ready into this. Anyway, we've been reading some uh, wonderful holiday stories and some darker holiday stories. Although the current one we're reading is uh, The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. It's kind of the origin story for good old Saint Nick. It's a little bit different than the uh, traditional stories about him. And they changed the reindeer names. That bothers me. Does that bother anybody else? It bothers me. I mean, Flossy and Glossy were all right. I thought maybe they'd just be like additions, but where's Donner and Blitz and Comet and Cupid and all them? I mean, I could understand if they omitted Rudolph. He's supposed to be a latecomer. It's just not the same. In any case, I hope you've been enjoying it. Right, JMath? I also seriously wonder if uh, if Santa Claus is from Australia. Because uh, I don't know how much you guys know about the, uh, the Oz stories, but the uh, land of Oz is actually supposed to be down in Australia. And... Uh, that's where they're supposedly based from the uh, Wizard of Oz books. So uh, kind of wondered if the forest of Bursey. Well, I don't know, honestly. If somebody wants to look that up during the stream, that'd be. Uh, and then share it with us in the discord, that'd be pretty cool. give us an idea of uh uh no there's no unlurk command and i believe the lurk only lasts for the single stream so you should be good i don't think you need to uh need to type unlurk <laughs> uh, well this will be our last day of holiday tales and we'll return to our regular books um, starting with the tuesday stream so we will be back to conan on tuesday and the murder on the links on wednesday friday um, i don't know if we were i think we were finished with itinerant house so we may be starting a new author on friday and then uh, Nicholas Nick will be on Saturday. Yeah, I do. I do enjoy the descriptive sentences in those books. I really do. It's a, it feels like a guilty pleasure. Like it's not. No disparagement meant to Mr. Howard, but let's be honest. It's not serious literature, right? It's uh, swords and sorcery and evil wizards and. It's, it's fun. And so the delight that I take in reading some of his uh, scenes and sentences and, and word choice and his flair kind of feels like biting into a thick, chewy brownie or even a Twinkie or something like that. Like, you know, it's not great for you, but damn if it isn't fun. Kind of surprised that Vela and Little Dude haven't uh, popped in yet. Hope everything's all right there. Although they could be busy. I think they do family stuff on. No, they do family stuff on Sundays. I don't know. I hope they're all right anyway. <laughs> They'll get a tardy slip. Okay. Well, that's the poem we read the other day, the night before Christmas. 
and uh, yeah so that definitely predates Frank L. Baum I'm pretty sure so yeah he got him wrong shame on him tisk tisk thank you for uh, thank you for looking that up Sparky really appreciate it so we were reading and we were about to start on the first Christmas tree. We just heard about how the stockings being hung over the fireplace came to be. No, no, it won't let you do a link. Uh, you could post the link. Hmm. I suppose you aren't in the Discord, are you? Shame. All right. Well, we'll figure it out later. For now, I suppose we should jump into the story. <laughs> Can't prove your references. Can't do proper citation. You could just do a, a space between where the, the dot would be instead of like dot com or whatever. Break up the link. That's what that big follows bot does. Which uh, Twitter or Twitch apparently did an investigation on and in, uh, supposedly is getting rid of we'll see what happens there in any case chapter 12 the first christmas tree claus had always kept his promise to the nooks by returning to the laughing valley by daybreak but only the swiftness of his reindeer has enabled him to do this for he travels all over the world he loved his work and he loved the brisk night ride on his sledge and the gay tinkle of the sleigh bells. On that first trip with the tin reindeer, only Glossy and Flossy wore bells. But each year thereafter, for eight years, Claus carried presents to the children of the Gnome King, and that good-natured monarch gave him in return a string of bells at each visit, so that finally every one of the ten deer was supplied. And you may imagine what a merry tune the bells played as the sledge sped over the snow. The children's stockings were so long that it required a great many toys to fill them. And soon Claus found there were other things besides toys that children love. So he sent some of the fairies, who were always his good friends, into the tropics, from whence they returned with great bags full of oranges and bananas, which they had plucked from the trees. And other fairies flew to the wonderful valley of Funnyland. <laughs> okay. P H U N N Y L A N D. Funnyland. Where delicious candies and bonbons grew thickly on the bushes and returned laden with many boxes of sweetmeats for the little ones. These things Santa Claus, on each Christmas Eve, placed in the long stockings together with his toys and the children were glad to get them, you may be sure. There are also warm countries where there is no snow in winter, but Claus and his reindeer visited them as well as the colder climes, for there were little wheels inside the runners of his sledge, which permitted it to run as smoothly over bare ground as on the snow. And the children who lived in the warm countries learned to know the name of Santa Claus as well as those who lived nearer to the Laughing Valley. Once, just as the reindeer were ready to start on their yearly trip, a fairy came to Claus and told him of three little children who lived beneath a rude tent of skins on a broad plain where there were no trees whatever. These poor babies were miserable and unhappy, for their parents were ignorant people who neglected them sadly. Claus resolved to visit these children before he returned home. And during his ride, he picked up the bushy top of a pine tree, which the wind had broken off, and placed it in his sledge. It was nearly morning, when the deer stopped before the lonely tent of skins, where the poor children lay asleep. Claus at once planted the bit of pine tree in the sand, and stuck many candles on the branches. Then he hung some of his prettiest toys on the tree, as well as several bags of candies. It did not take long to do all this, for Santa Claus works quickly, and when all was ready, he lighted the candles, and thrusting his head in at the opening of the tent, he shouted, Merry Christmas, little ones. With that, he leapt into his sledge, and it was away out of sight before the children, 
rubbing the sleep from their eyes, could come out to see who had called them. You can imagine the wonder and joy of those little ones, who had never in their lives known a real pleasure before, when they saw the tree sparkling with lights that shone brilliant in the gray dawn, and hung with toys enough to make them happy for years to come. They joined hands and danced around the tree, shouting and laughing, until they were obliged to pause for breath. Hey, little dude, glad you could make it. And their parents also came out to look and wonder, and thereafter had more respect and consideration for their children, since Santa Claus had honored them with such beautiful gifts. The idea of the Christmas tree pleased Claus, and so the following year he carried many of them in his sledge and set them up in the homes of poor people who seldom saw trees, and placed candles and toys on the branches. Of course, he could not carry enough trees in one load of all who wanted them. But in some homes, the fathers were able to get trees and have them all ready for Santa Claus when he arrived. And these the good Claus always decorated as prettily as possible and hung with toys enough for all the children who came to see the tree lighted. These novel ideas and the generous manner in which they were carried out made the children long for that one night in the year when their friend Santa Claus should visit them. And as such anticipation is very pleasant and comforting, the little ones gleaned much happiness by wondering what would happen when Santa Claus next arrived. Perhaps you remember that stern Baron Brown, who once drove Claus from his castle and forbade him to visit his children. Well, many years afterward, when the old Baron was dead and his son ruled in his place, the new Baron Braun came to the house of Claus with his train of knights and pages and henchmen, and dismounting from his charger, bared his head humbly before the friend of children. My father did not know your goodness and worth, he said, and therefore threatened to hang you from the castle walls. But I have children of my own who long for a visit from Santa Claus, and I have come to beg that you will favor them hereafter, as you do other children. Claus was pleased with this speech, for Castle Braun was the only place he had never visited, and he gladly promised to bring presents to the Baron's children the next Christmas Eve. The Baron went away contented, and Claus kept his promise faithfully. Thus did this man, though through very goodness, conquer the hearts of all, and it is no wonder he was ever merry and gay, for there was no home in the wide world where he was not welcomed more royally than any king. Now we come to old age, and the mantle of immortality. And now we come to a turning point in the career of Santa Claus, and it is my duty to relate the most remarkable that has happened since the world began or mankind was created. We have followed the life of Claus from the time he was found a helpless infant by the wood nymph Nasil, and reared to manhood in the great forest of Bursi. And we know how he began to make toys for children, and how with the assistance and good will of the immortals he was able to distribute them to the little ones throughout the world. For many years he carried on this noble work, for the simple, hard-working life he led gave him perfect health and strength. And doubtless, a man can live longer in the beautiful Laughing Valley, where there are no cares and everything is peaceful and merry than in any other part of the world. But when many years had rolled away, Santa Claus grew old. The long beard of golden brown that once covered his cheeks and chin gradually became gray and finally turned to pure white. His hair was white too, and there were wrinkles at the corners of his eyes which showed plainly when he laughed. He had never been a very tall man, and now he became fat and waddled very much like a duck when he walked. But in spite of these things, he remained as lively as ever and was just as jolly and gay, and his kind eyes sparkled as brightly as they did that first day when he came to the Laughing Valley. Yet a time is sure to come when every mortal who has grown old and lived his life is required to li leave this world for another. And it is no wonder that after Santa Claus had driven his reindeer on many and many a Christmas Eve, 
those staunch friends finally whispered among themselves that they had probably drawn his sledge for the last time. Then all the forest of Bursey became sad, and all the Laughing Valley was hushed, for every living thing that had known Claus had used to love him and to brighten at the sound of his footsteps or the notes of his merry whistle. No doubt the old man's strength was at last exhausted, for he made no more toys, but lay on his bed as in a dream. The nymph Nasile, she who had reared him and been his foster mother, was still youthful and strong and beautiful, and it seemed to her but a short time since this aged, gray-bearded man had lain in her arms and smiled on her with his innocent baby lips. In this is shown the difference between mortals and immortals. It was fortunate that the great Auk came to the forest at this time. Nasil sought him with troubled eyes and told him of the fate that threatened their friend Claus. At once the master became grave, and he leaned upon his axe and stroked his grizzled beard thoughtfully for many minutes. Then suddenly he stood up straight and poised his powerful head with firm resolve and stretched out his great right arm as if determined on doing some mighty deed. For a thought had come to him, so grand in its conception, that all the world might well bow before the master woodsman and honor his name for ever. It is well known that when the great Auk once undertakes to do a thing, he never hesitates an instant. Now he summoned his fleetest messengers and sent them in a flash to many parts of the earth. And when they were gone, he turned to the anxious Nasil and comforter, saying, Be of good heart, my child. Our friend still lives. And now run to your queen and tell her that I have summoned a council of all the immortals of the world to meet me with me here in Bursey this night. If they obey and hearken unto my words, Claus will drive his reindeer for countless ages yet to come. At midnight, there was a wondrous scene in the ancient forest of Bursey, where for the first time in many centuries, the rulers of the immortals who inhabit the earth were gathered together. There was the queen of the water sprites, whose beautiful form was as clear as crystal, but continually dripped water on the bank of moss where she sat. And beside her was the king of the sleep fays, who carried a wand from the end of which a fine dust fell all around, so that no mortal could keep awake long enough to see him, as mortal eyes were sure to close in sleep as soon as the dust filled them. And next to him sat the gnome king, whose people inhabit all that region under the earth's surface where they guard the precious metals and jewel stones that lie buried in rock and ore. At his right hand stood the king of the sound imps, who had wings on his feet, for his people are swift to carry all sounds that are made. When they are busy, they carry the sounds but short distances, for there are not many of them. But sometimes they speed with the sounds to places miles and miles away from where they are made. The king of the sound imps had an anxious and careworn face, for most people have no consideration for his imps, and especially the boys and girls make a great many unnecessary sounds which the imps are obliged to carry when they might be better employed. So I guess you have the, uh, the sound imps to thank for carrying my words to all of you and uh, letting you hear the sound of my voice. So make sure you give thanks to the sound imps. So for uh, enabling us to have story time. The next in the circle of immortals was the king of the wind demons, slender of frame, restless, and uneasy at being confined to one place for even an hour. Once in a while, he would leave his place and circle around the glade, and each time he did this, the fairy queen was obliged to untangle the flowing locks of her golden hair and tuck them back behind her pink ears. But she did not complain, for it was not often that the king of the wind demons came into the heart of the forest. After the fairy queen, whose home you know was an old Bursey, came the king of the light elves with his two princes, Flash and Twilight, at his back. He never went anywhere without his princes, for they were so mischievous that he dared not let them wander alone. Prince Flash bore a lightning bolt in his right hand and a horn of gunpowder in his left and his bright eyes roved constantly around, 
as if he longed to use his blinding flashes. Prince Twilight held a great snuffer in one hand and a big black cloak in the other, and it is well known that unless Twilight is carefully watched, the snuffers or the cloak will throw everything into darkness, and darkness is the greatest enemy the King of the Light Elves has. <laughs> Yes, indeed, praise the sound imps. In addition to the immortals I have named, were the king of the nooks, who had come from his home in the jungles of India, and the king of the rills, who lived among the gay flowers and luscious fruits of Valencia. Sweet Queen Zerline of the wood nymphs completed the circle of immortals. But in the center of the circle sat three others who possessed powers so great that all the kings and queens showed them reverence. These were Ak, the master woodsman of the world, who rules the forests and orchards and the groves, and Kern, the master husbandman of the world, who rules the grain fields and the meadows and gardens, and Bo, the master mariner of the world, who rules the seas and all the craft that float thereon, and all other immortals are more or less subject to these three. When all had assembled, the master woodsman of the world stood up to address them, since he himself had summoned them to council. Very clearly he told them the story of Claus, beginning at the time when as a babe he had been adopted a child of the forest, and telling of his noble and generous nature, and his lifelong labors to make children happy. And now, said Auk, when he had won the love of all the world, the spirit of death is hovering over him. Of all men who have inhabited the earth, None other so well deserves immortality, for such a life cannot be spared so long as there are children of mankind to miss him and to grieve over his loss. We immortals are the servants of the world, and to serve the world we were permitted in the beginning to exist. But what one of us is more worthy of immortality than this man Claus, who so sweetly ministers to the little children? He paused and glanced around the circle, to find every immortal listening to him eagerly and nodding approval. Finally, the king of the wind demons, who had been whistling softly to himself, cried out, What is your desire, O Ak? To bestow upon Claus the mantle of immortality, said Ak boldly. That this demand was wholly unexpected was proved by the immortals springing to their feet and looking into each other's face with dismay, and then upon Ak with wonder for it was a grave matter, this parting with the mantle of immortality. The queen of the water sprites spoke in her low, clear voice, and the words sounded like raindrops splashing upon a windowpane. In all the world there is but one mantle of immortality, she said. The king of the sound phase added, it has existed since the beginning, and no mortal has ever dared to claim it. And the master mariner of the world arose and stretched his limbs, saying, Only by the vote of every immortal can it be bestowed upon a mortal. I know all this, answered Ock quietly, but the mantle exists, and if it was created, as you say, in the beginning, it was because the supreme master knew that some day it would be required. Until now, no mortal has deserved it. But who among you dares deny that the good clause deserves it? Will you not all vote to bestow it upon him? They were silent, still looking upon one another questioningly. Of what use is the mantle of immortality unless it is worn, demanded Ak? What will it profit any one of us to allow it to remain in its lonely shrine for all time to come? Enough, cried the Gnome King abruptly. We will vote on the matter, yes or no. For my part, I say yes. And I, said the fairy queen promptly, and Ak re rewarded her with a smile. My people in Bursey tell me they have learned to love him. Therefore, I vote to give Claus the mantle, said the king of the rills. He is already a comrade of the Nooks, announced the ancient king of that band. Let him have immortality. Let him have it. Let him have it, sighed the king of the wind, de wind demons. Why not, asked the king of the sleep phase. He never disturbs the slumbers my people allow humanity. Let the good claws be immortal. I do not object, said the king of the sound imps. 
nor I, murmured the queen of the water sprites. If Claus does not receive the mantle, it is clear none other can ever claim it, remarked the king of the light elves. So let us have done with the thing for all time. The wood nymphs were the first to adopt him, said Queen Zerline. Of course I shall vote to make him immortal. Ak now turned to the master husbandman of the world, who held up his right arm and said yes. And the master mariner of the world did likewise, after which Ak, with sparkling eyes and smiling face, cried out, I thank you, fellow immortals, for all have voted yes, and so to our dear claws shall fall the one mantle of immortality that is in our power to bestow. Let us fetch it at once, said the Fay King. I'm in a hurry. They bowed assent, and instantly the forest glade was deserted. But in a place, midway between the earth and the sky, was suspended a gleaming crypt of gold and platinum, a glow with soft lights shed from the facets of countless gems. Within a high dome hung the precious mantle of immortality, and each immortal placed a hand on the hem of the splendid robe, and said, as with one voice, we bestow this mantle upon Claus, who is called the patron saint of children. At this, the mantle came away from its lofty crypt, and they carried it to the house in the Laughing Valley. The spirit of death was crouching very near to the bedside of Claus, and as the immortals approached, she sprang up and motioned them back with an angry gesture. But when her eyes fell upon the mantle, they bore she shrank away with a low moan of disappointment and quitted that house for ever softly and silently the immortal band dropped upon claws the precious mantle and it closed about him and sank into the outlines of his body and disappeared from view it became a part of his being and neither mortal nor immortal might ever take it from him the then the kings and queens who had wrought this great deed dispersed to their various homes, and all were well contented that they had added another immortal to their band. And Claus slept on, the red blood of everlasting life coursing swiftly through his veins, and on his brow was a tiny drop of water that had fallen from the ever-melting gown of the queen of the water sprites, and over his lips hovered a tender kiss that had been left by the sweet nymph Nasil for she had stolen in when the others were gone to gaze with rapture upon the immortal form of her foster son. Chapter 2 When the World Grew Old The next morning, when Santa Claus opened his eyes and gazed around the familiar room, which he had feared he might never see again, he was astonished to find his old strength renewed and to feel the red blood of perfect health coursing through his veins. He sprang from his bed and stood where the bright sunshine came in through his window and flooded him with merry dancing rays. He did not then understand what had happened to restore to him the vigor of youth, but in spite of the fact that his beard remained the color of snow and that wrinkles still lingered at the corners of his bright eyes, old Santa Claus felt as brisk and merry as a boy of sixteen and was soon whistling contentedly as he busied himself fashioning new toys. Then, Ock came to him and told of the mantle of immortality and how Claus had won it through his love for little children. It made old Santa look grave for a moment to think he had been so favored, but it also made him glad to realize that now he need never fear being parted from his dear ones. At once he began preparations for making a remarkable assortment of pretty and amusing playthings and in larger quantities than ever before. For now that he might always devote himself to this work, he decided that no child in the world, poor or rich, should hereafter go without a Christmas gift, if he could manage to supply it. The world was new in the days when dear old Santa Claus first began toy-making, and won, by his loving deeds, the mantle of immortality. And the task of supplying cheering words, sympathy, and pretty playthings to all the young of his race did not seem a difficult undertaking at all. But every year, more and more children were born into the world. And these, when they grew up, began spreading slowly over all the face of the earth, seeking new homes 
so that Santa Claus found each year that his journeys must extend farther and farther from the Laughing Valley, and that the packs of toys must be made larger and ever larger. So at length he took counsel with his fellow immortals how his work might keep pace with the increasing number of children that none might be neglected. And the immortals were so greatly interested in his labors that they gladly rendered him their assistance. Ak gave him his man Kilter, the silent and swift. And the Nook Prince gave him Peter, who was more crooked and less surly than any of his brothers. And the Rill Prince gave him Nutter, the sweetest-tempered Rill ever known. And the Fairy Queen gave him Whisk, that tiny, mischievous but lovable fairy who knows today almost as many children as does Santa Claus himself. With these people to help make the toys, and to keep his house in order, and to look after the sledge and the harness, Santa Claus found it much easier to prepare his yearly load of gifts, and his days began to follow one, one another smoothly and pleasantly. Yet after a few generations, his worries were renewed, for it was remarkable how the number of people continued to grow, and how many more children there were every year to be served. When the people filled all the cities and lands of one country, they wandered into another part of the world, and the men cut down the trees in many of the great forests that had been ruled by Ak, and with the wood they built new cities, and where the forests had been were fields of grain and herds of browsing cattle. You might think the master woodsman would rebel at the loss of his forests, but not so. The wisdom of Ak was mighty and far-seeing. The world was made for men, said he to Santa Claus, and I have but guarded the forests until men needed them for their use. I am glad my strong trees can furnish shelter for men's weak bodies and warm them through the cold winters. But I hope they will not cut down all the trees, for mankind needs the shelter of the woods in summer as much as the warmth of blazing logs in winter. <laughs> yes, funny indeed how that happens. And, however crowded the world may grow, I do not think men will ever come to Bursey, nor to the great black forest, nor to the wooded wilderness of Braz, unless they seek their shades for pleasure and not to destroy their giant trees. By and by, people made ships from the tr tree trunks and crossed over oceans and built cities in far lands. But the oceans made little difference to the journeys of Santa Claus. His reindeer sped over the waters as swiftly as over land, and his sledge headed from east to west and followed in the wake of the sun, so that as the earth rolled slowly over, Santa Claus had all of twenty-four hours to encircle it each Christmas Eve, and the speedy reindeer enjoyed these wonderful journeys more and more. So year after year, and generation after generation, and century after century, the world grew older and the people became more numerous, and the labors of Santa Claus steadily increased. The fame of his good deeds spread to every household where children dwelt, and all the little ones loved him dearly, and the fathers and mothers honored him for the happiness he had given them when they too were young, and the aged grandsires and granddames remembered him with tender gratitude and blessed his name. Chapter 3 the deputies of Santa Claus. However, there was one evil following in the path of civilization that caused Santa Claus a vast amount of trouble before he discovered a way to overcome it. But fortunately, it was the last trial he was forced to undergo. One Christmas Eve, when his reindeer had leaped to the top of a new building, Santa Claus was surprised to find that the chimney had been built much smaller than usual. But he had no time to think about it just then. So he drew in his breath and made himself as small as possible and slid down the chimney. I ought to be at the bottom by this time, he thought, as he continued to slip downward. But no fireplace of any sort met his view, and by and by he reached the very end of the chimney, which was in the cellar. This is odd, he reflected, much puzzled by this experience. If there is no fireplace, what on earth is the chimney good for? Then 
he began to climb out again and found it hard work, the space being so small. And on his way up, he noticed a thin, round pipe sticking through the side of the chimney, but could not guess what it was for. Finally, he reached the roof and said to the reindeer, There was no need of my going down that chimney, for I could find no fireplace through which to enter the house. I fear the children that live there must go without playthings this Christmas. Then he drove on, but soon came to another new house with a small chimney. This caused Santa Claus to shake his head doubtfully, but he tried the chimney nevertheless and found it exactly like the other. Moreover, he nearly stuck fast in the narrow flue and tore his jacket trying to get out again. So, although he came to several such chimneys that night, he did not venture to descend any more of them. All right, I'll be right back. Give me just a moment. Sorry about that. All right, I'll 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 tell you guys, but you got to promise not to laugh at me. <laughs> wow, way to make that awkward. No, nope, it was definitely pouring tea. I, uh, I do not take my PC and my mic and all that into the uh, head with me. Ah... Uh, I can mute my mic when I pour the tea, if you like. I thought that was all like ASMR, right? <laughs> you're awful. I'm glad you're here, Panda, but awful. Awful, awful pun. I'm proud of you. So, uh... I might have inhaled a con of hair, <clears throat> which uh, did not feel too terribly great on the back of my throat. I, I believe you. <laughs> well, I do need to refill my teacup, so. Should I mute or uh, should I pour it where you guys can hear it? Don't want to make you feel awkward or uh, like you need to run off to the head or anything. And no, no, I should not breathe in the puppy hairs. Puppy hairs are, are not good to breathe. If you're sure, J-Math, I mean, you, you brought it up. Oh, dude. No. Gross. Super gross. He really kind of did, didn't he? <sighs> I'm not starting over, though. Look at that. I think you drove viewers away. Shame on you, J-Math. Shame, shame. <sighs> All right. Well, now that I'm done peeing into my teacup for J Math, <laughs> awkward. <sighs> what in the world are people thinking of? to build such useless chimneys, he exclaimed. 
In all the years I have traveled with my reindeer, I have never seen the like before. True enough, but Santa Claus had not then discovered that stoves had been invented and were fast coming into use. When he did find it out, he wondered how the builders of those houses could have so little consideration for him when they knew very well it was his custom to climb down chimneys and enter houses by way of the fireplaces. Perhaps the men who built those houses had outgrown their own love for toys and were indifferent whether Santa Claus called on their children or not. Whatever the explanation might be, the poor children were forced to bear the burden of grief and disappointment. The following year, Santa Claus found more and more of the new-fashioned chimneys that had no fireplaces. And the next year, still more. The third year, so numerous had the narrow chimneys become, he even had a few toys left in his sledge that he was unable to give away because he could not get to the children. The matter had now become so serious that it worried the good man greatly and he decided to talk it over with Kilter and Peter and Nutter and Whisk. Kilter already knew something about it, for it, been, for it had been his duty to run around to all the houses just before Christmas and gather up the notes and letters to Santa Claus that the children had written, telling what they wished put in their stockings or hung on their Christmas trees. But Kilter was a silent fellow, and seldom spoke of what he saw in the cities and villages. The others were very indignant. <laughs> Those people act as if they do not wish their children to be made happy, said sensible Peter, in a vexed tone. The idea of shutting out such a generous friend to their little ones. But it is my intention to make children happy, whether their parents wish it or not, returned Santa Claus. Years ago, when I first began making toys, children were even more neglected by their parents than they are now, and so I have learned to pay no attention to thoughtless or selfish parents, but to consider only the longings of childhood. You are right, my master, said Nutter the Rill. Many children would lack a friend if you did not consider them, and try to make them happy. Then, declared the laughing whisk, we must abandon any thought of using these new-fashioned chimneys, but become burglars and break into the houses some other way. What way? asked Santa Claus. Why, walls of brick and wood and plaster are nothing to fairies. I can easily pass through them whenever I wish, and so can Peter and Nutter and Kilter. Is it not so, comrades? I often pass through the walls when I gather up the letters, said Kilter, and that was a long speech for him, and so surprised Peter and Nutter that their big round eyes nearly popped out of their heads. Therefore, continued the fairy, you may as well take us with you on your next journey, and when we come to one of those houses with stoves instead of fireplaces, we will distribute the toys to the children without the need of using a chimney. That seems to me a good plan, replied Santa Claus well pleased at having solved the problem. We will try it next year. That was how the fairy, the pixie, the nook, and the rill all rode in the sledge with their master the following Christmas Eve, and they had no trouble at all in entering the new-fashioned houses and leaving toys for the children that lived in them. And their deft services not only relieved Santa Claus of much labor, but enabled him to complete his own work more quickly than usual so that the merry party found themselves at home with an empty sledge a full hour before daybreak. The only drawback to the journey was that the mischievous whisk persisted in tickling the reindeer with a long feather to see them jump, and Santa Claus found it necessary to watch him every minute and to tweak his long ears once or twice to make him behave himself. But taken all together, the trip was a great success. And to this day, the four little folk always accompany Santa Claus on his yearly ride and help him in the distribution of his gifts. But the indifference of parents, which had so annoyed the good saint, did not continue very long. 
and Santa Claus soon found they were really anxious he should visit their homes on Christmas Eve and leave presents for their children. So, to lighten his task, which was fast becoming very difficult indeed, old Santa decided to ask the parents to assist him. Get your Christmas trees all ready for my coming, he said to them, and then I shall be able to leave the presents without loss of time, and you can put them on the trees when I am gone. And to others, he said, see that the children's stockings are hung up in readiness for my coming, and then I can fill them quick as a wink. And often, when parents were kind and good-natured, Santa Claus would simply fling down his package of gifts and leave the fathers and mothers to fill the stockings after he had darted away in his sledge. I will make all loving parents my deputies, cried the jolly old fellow, and they shall help me do my work. For in this way I shall save many precious minutes, and few children need be neglected for lack of time to visit them. Besides carrying around the big packs and his swift flying sledge, old Santa began to send great heaps of toys to the toy shops, so that if parents wanted larger supplies for their children, they could easily get them. And if any children were, by chance, missed by Santa Claus on his yearly rounds, they could go to the toy shops and get enough to make them happy and contented. For the loving friend of the little ones decided that no child, if he could help it, should long for toys in vain. And the toy, toy shops also proved convenient whenever a child fell ill and needed a new toy to amuse it. And sometimes, on birthdays, the fathers and mothers go to the toy shops and get pretty gifts for their children in honor of the happy event. Perhaps you will now understand how, in spite of the bigness of the world, Santa Claus is able to supply all the children with beautiful gifts. To be sure, the old gentleman is rarely seen in these days, but it is not because he tries to keep out of sight, I assure you. Santa Claus is the same loving friend of children that in the old days used to play and romp with them by the hour, and I know he would love to do the same now, if he had the time. But you see, he is so busy all the year making toys, and so hurried on that one night when he visits our homes with his packs, that he comes and goes among us like a flash and it is almost impossible to catch a glimpse of him. And, although there are millions and millions more children in the world than there used to be, Santa Claus has never been known to complain of their increasing numbers. The more the merrier, he cries, with his jolly laugh. And the only difference to him is the fact that his little workmen have to make their busy fingers fly faster every year to satisfy the demands of so many little ones. In all this world, there is nothing so beautiful as a happy child, says good old Santa Claus. And if he had his way, the children would all be beautiful, for all would be happy. The end of the life and adventures of Santa Claus. So what do you guys think? Other than he named the reindeer wrong. One star? <laughs> Brutal. Brutal. You don't think that's a little harsh? JMath with the savage critique. Panda, Vela, Sparky, what do you guys think? Are you going to join J-Math with his one-star review? Perhaps we shall have some crickets.
Check them DMs. All right. Well, we're hitting our intermission. Interesting that uh, Santa Claus became a capitalist. I mean, I knew he was outsourcing his labor, but... Opening retail outlets? That's kind of surprising. So, the question is, what do we read now? <laughs> Not quite. Not quite. Anybody get any cool stuff for uh, the holidays? Any fun presents? Anything especially exciting? I got something pretty cool. I got this Lego set that is a replica of an old CRT TV and 8-bit uh, Nintendo system. And the TV has a rotating screen that makes it look like... Uh, it's playing a Super Mario level with gears and stuff like that. So that Mario actually like runs and jumps as you turn a crank. Once I build it, I'll post some, uh, some pictures in the Discord. French press, all right. So you have something to drink during, uh, during story time. Yeah, it looks super cool. I'm excited to, to put it together. It should be really neat. And yes, I am the the overgrown man-child whose uh, parents still buy him toys for uh, holidays and whatnot. Yeah, but I think I'm going to put it in my office rather than in the gaming area. I still want to do a big mural on the wall of a uh, Super Mario level. Although I am considering, I've got uh, these like square like cubby shelves. I figure I could do them up like Tetris pieces. I think that would be cool. been playing this um, new game on Xbox called... Uh, the Tetris Effect Connection. And it's actually really cool. It's uh, it's Tetris, but with a couple of tweaks and the ability to go head to head with people. And um, there's some really cool like music and graphics that go around the board and kind of make it extra challenging. And the speed of the pieces will vary throughout the level so you could be at one speed for half the level and then suddenly it jumps and goes way faster as the music speeds up and then it slows down a little bit and then jumps and goes fast again and uh, having to adjust to the speed that the pieces are falling makes it even more challenging and then some of them i'm just like ah, no no go to it yeah okay i died it's over 
Never heard of that. Although one of my favorite games for the 16-bit Nintendo was a game called Tetris Attack, which really had nothing to do with Tetris. Um, it's kind of more like an early Candy Crush or something like that. But it was themed with like baby Yoshi and Yoshi's friends. And uh, you would switch pieces and you'd try to make, uh, I think it was lines of four or more vertically or horizontally. And all you could do was do a left right swap of pieces. But you could play head to head against people and uh, drop the trash blocks and stuff on their heads and things like that. And it was really cool. He used to be really fast at it. I'm not as fast anymore, but it's still a really cool game. It's very, it's pretty rare, but uh, if you can find it, it's a lot of fun. It's called Tetris Attack. So, again, I ask, what shall we read for the second half of this? Or should we do some gaming or something instead? We could play some of the new patch of, uh, of Stardew. Or I could buy Phasma real quick and uh, you all could laugh at me if I scare myself silly playing Phasma. <laughs> My best friend and I play Dr. Mario all the time. She gets a little frustrated sometimes. She plays on difficulty two or three, and I play on difficulty like eight. But it's a lot of fun. That and Galga. Play Galga. <laughs> Who's launching the pillows, you or uh, your uh, your husband? Or do you not play it anymore? Yeah, Galga was a great game. It's cool that you programmed it. Well, I assume that's what you mean. It's that you programmed it. I suppose it could have been like a capstone baking class and you recreated a, a screen from the game and, and a cake or cookies or something. All right. Um, I think if you've got RCA jacks, that's the uh, the yellow, red, and white jacks, you can actually uh, still connect it. But all right, let's play some Stardew. I'm going to jump in the cozy chair channel so that I can hear the other people who jump in and join me. If you want to join the game, um, I'm not sure how many we're limited to, but uh, squeeze in everybody that we can. Um, so just jump in the Discord and 
hang out and uh, we'll do a little bit of gaming. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's do that. Something a little different. Just let me get logged into Steam. Sorry, I glanced over at Discord and the uh, the mighty gecko sent me an absolutely hilarious little uh, video. It was super cute. Loading up Stardew. I'll post the code in the Discord. In the uh, the general discussion. Just give me one moment and I'll grab it. All right, code is posted in the bedtime Discord. So if you want to jump in, grab that code and go ahead and uh, join in. And let's find the gameplay stream. All right, there we go. No, we uh, we harvested them, so the flowers are in the chest. So they're around still. Um, well, Vela might jump in because she's been around, but I don't think Random's in, so go ahead and jump in uh, random slot for the moment. We'll have to see if we can build another cabin to add another player. Oh, okay, so you can't jump in? All right. Wheel. Let's start a new farm then.
So, yes, skull shirt. Skull shirt for sure. Okay. Um, the beach farm's kind of cool, so let's do that. Money shared, profit margin normal. Three starting cabins. Shouldn't there be an option for monsters? There we go. Remixed, remixed. Nope, three only. All we got. Hello, Bobby. How are you? We are streaming some uh, Stardew if you care to join us. That's probably a good idea. But I can remember how to do that. Uh, anybody know how to do that? I bet I can do it in the control panel on Twitch. Let's see. Stream manager. Edit stream info. Post story time Stardew. Done. Oh no, I forgot to skip the intro. Shoot. Rip. I have no idea what Katamari is. Sorry, I fail. I fail at a great many things, really. I'm okay with it. You have to roll up the world. Why did dad break the universe? This. This seems like a terrible decision, though. This seems like a bad plan. Dad makes bad plans. Also, if Dad is the king of the cosmos, why in the heck am I tiny? This doesn't make sense. Shut up, Jmath. All right, there we go. New code posted.
We're going to reduce the sound a bit because that was awful loud. Maybe. Yes. Ugh, I know. It's awful. So awful. But you get parsnip seeds. That makes everything better, right? Why are you com Where's the There's got to be something where I can shut off that tutorial thingy. That's going to be annoying. You jumping in, J-Math? That, that just seems awkward. Like, potentially more awkward than JMath's T comments. Although, those are pretty awkward. Was it PC or a console game or... Ah, okay, you look frightening. You, here, you look, you look frightening. You jumped out from behind that tree like you were a monster that was going to eat my face. And as there's been a recent update, and I don't know all the things in the update, you could very well have been a monster that was going to eat my face. So, are you joining us, Jema? Are you joining us? Not that I created a whole new farm and Drea, like, made a whole new character just so you could play with us or anything like that. On the farm. J Math looks kind of like a zombie. I would queue that up, but we're streaming, and then that would be like copyrighted stuff on stream, and then I'd, you know, be charged for the felony in the United States. Hmm. 
Maybe. Say something? Either of you? Nope, I don't think they can. So now I just sound like a crazy person talking to myself, but that's okay. Anybody in the chat mind me sounding like a crazy person? Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> well, she talked again. Did you hear? I think no I thought it was Leah okay I don't know well I think we'll go ahead and end the stream here because I think it's just fella the two of you me in the stream now so seems like a good place to stop as we can just hang out in the discord and chat and play so thank you everyone for uh watching get checking out the holiday stories and i hope to see you all on tuesday whether you're catching this on the vod or you're listening live but thank you very much wait straight oh right okay crazy person talking Ha 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 ha, Bella.